Ron said long, long time ago, I, uh, I figured out how to make hats, but ten years before I made the first one is when I had the original idea. And it was because of a book called Understanding Wood. Uh, if you're a wood turner and you don't have that book, you should get it. There's a lot of good information in there. Written by a guy named Bruce Hoadley. Uh, the chapter in the book called Treen is good reading because it's all about working green wood. The most common treen is a wooden spoon, one piece item. Everything green wood has to be, a, no joinery. You can't do joinery with green wood. It's going to move. And he writes that you can also make a bowl, once-turned bowl. We all know what that means. But he recommended that you do a twice-turned proper bowl. You've got to uh, turn it once and thick and let it dry for a year and then turn it again. Well, I don't like turning dry wood. It's no fun. It's miserable. Tools get dull. The, the dust has a ability to hang in the air for hours. Whereas wet wood dust hits the floor in minutes. And uh, a lot of good things. This thing keeps cutting in and out. Um, yeah, he kind of poo-pooed the idea of one's turn bowl because it gets oval. And you want a proper bowl that had turn it twice, make a nice round bowl. I said, now, wait a minute, I like oval. I got nothing against oval. And all of that, you know, and I knew all that already. I'm reading it. There it is in black and white. And he's kind of ovalness. And I'm going, hey, bottom line here is turn wet wood, get oval product. Ah, that's where it came from. And I immediately dismissed the idea because I thought, dumbass, don't have stupid ideas. Who wants a wooden hat? So I didn't make one because I thought it was a silly idea for 10 years. Like, but I, once the seed is planted, you can't unplant it. There it is. It's in there. It grows. And then Albert Likoff, if you don't know who he is, he was, was, and was is the accurate right now because he finally retired a couple of months ago, was the director of the Wood Turning Center in Philadelphia. And he was a good friend of mine because I did a lot of work with him. We did shows, and I, my big, I was making vases this tall because I have an Oliver. I could do that. I got this big leg, weighs 3,300 pounds. And uh, I was making, I was actually a stair builder, a builder, and providing columns and things for buildings by others. And so I was making these big vessels, and Albert and I worked together, and comes time for him to marry his girlfriend, Tina, they send out a wedding invitation. And he says, we're having a Western wedding. Please come dressed appropriately. And it's like the hand coming down out of the clouds. Turn the hat, stupid. So <laughs> I turned the hat number one for that wedding, and it was craziness because everybody thought, where did you get such a crazy idea? You know, wow. Because, of course, everybody there was either a woodturner or a spouse of or both, and they just thought it was the wildest thing. And it's a funny thing, because all the people at the wedding, only Albert's father, my then wife, and I, so when they called the category hat to come up to the stage, there we were, the three of us. I was in the back, out the back door with friends talking, it was sort of a break in the action. They were doing other categories of Western dress, you know, boots, um, bolos, whatever, Western wear. Ladies with nice Western dresses on were asked to come up to the stage, and Albert would walk down the row and put his hand over the head, and the applause would get that person one of the cactus gardens off the reception table. So uh, they called hat. And I come walking, they're pushing me, because when they called Hat, Bedlam broke out in the room. And I go, what's going on? They, said, they called Hat, you got to go. So I go walking across the floor, there people were going nuts, banging the metal chairs together, screaming and hollering, whooping, whistling. I go, okay. <laughs> I get up to the stage, Albert comes up, he walks over his father, 
you could have heard a pin drop. <laughs> and my wife, nothing. And again, when he got to me, bedlam. So I said, oh boy, I guess I came up with something good. And, uh, and uh, since then I have, I, I, the, the gallery grade hats, the ones I make in studio when I'm there by myself, I number and the record in a book. Uh, there's 1,879 of those. And there's at least 700 of these kind of hats, demonstrating or teaching hats. I've been to Europe 42 times demonstrating and teaching hats. It's, it's bizarre, this whole hat thing. It's, and all riding on their ticket, of course. And uh, they buy the airline ticket, I get the points. <laughs> Not a bad deal. And uh, I was on the wood-turning cruise in 04. I'd love to do that again. If you haven't been on the wood-turning cruise, it's, it's, it's a good one. Twelve days, twelve ports, wood-turning all the way. Really fun. So, and hats for me has been it. Uh, but in doing all of this, what I'm doing right now, I basically gave away the store. I don't make hats or sell hats anymore. But in that process, I sold 9,000 videos, and I sold endless tools, and so it, it kind of changed. I'm still benefiting from being the hat man, but I'm not making and selling hats. And I think the biggest reason for that is all the galleries died 14 years ago. They closed their doors. They're all online. It's so different now. Different, different world. And the craft shows aren't doing very well either. So I'm perfectly happy being the, the tool maker I am now. Although my hands get black and all the control lathes have a black, oily substance on them. <laughs> uh, but uh, life changed and, and I'm doing it. And, and I'm 73 years old, so I'm about to call it quits anyway. <laughs> Anybody want, want, want to buy a tool business? <laughs> cheap, I'll sell it cheap. Um, so this will be probably number 701 demo hat I don't exactly know because I didn't number the demo hats but if you count 1879 numbered hats and 700 about demo hats that's 2500 or there about large hats that I've turned and mini hats I always do a mini hat demo as a part of a full day demo, so there's 700 of them too, and there's 2,300 numbered mini hats. And then there's micro hats that are two and a half, two and three eighths on the brim. They fit my thumb. They weigh, they're 15 thousandths of an inch thick. That's two thousandths less than a 64th. You turn them at like 3,000 RPM. You wear two pair of glasses because you're this close to it. <laughs> and uh, they weigh two grams they are a real 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 tour de force I don't do that with other people in the room I have to be alone for that <laughs> I have to stand and stare out the window and take deep breaths and kind of get into a zen mode because otherwise you're not going to succeed you really got to concentrate your thoughts and, and get serious to turn a micro hat alright so Funny enough, here we are in this relatively cool room, but we don't have a prepared block of wood. So we all have to go out in the sunshine for a little while I prep the block with a chainsaw. I brought six block, five blocks of yellow birch wood with me. This is a hat made of that wood. Um, it's totally unfinished. It has no finish on it at all. It's only sanded to 500 grit. Uh, I defy you to find a scratch on it. But um, it's great wood for hats because it bends really well. So, and my big bandsaw is down right now, not working. Upper blade guy gone, finished, over. So I couldn't prepare the blocks on the bandsaw before coming here, which I would normally do. Uh, so we're going to do it with a chainsaw outdoors, which is probably is a good thing because it makes it part of the demo. You get to see how I do it so it comes out to be a nice, balanced, symmetrical, 
piece of wood that you can put on a lathe that's not going to be make the lathe dance. I have a pattern that I use when I cut blocks of wood that I swear I put in my box. The pattern is basically a piece of plywood that's 16 inches, which is the typical size for a western hat, 7 inches high, has two tapers like that to make the, the block tapered. But we can eyeball all of that. All we need is the 16 inches and the 7 inches, and we got that here. All right? Ready to go outside? I'm not going to bother doing that cut because it's so small it'll be hard to stay in it. I'll just make the flat on top and we'll get rid of that on the leg. Yeah, it does that with its long shavings when you rip. If you can avoid that by angling a little bit, then the shavings get shorter. So i got to eyeball parallel here. It doesn't have to be perfect. It all comes out on the lathe. And then we need to make it octagonal and do a little tapering.
Back to work. So the happy news is I got a little wobble here. But the part that's away from me is all good. The part that um, my fingers are hitting is where I have that check. So we're going to get rid of that check a lot sooner. That's good. Sometimes you get lucky. I actually have the pith. I'm, I'm an eighth inch into the pith. That's, that's why this one happened. This is a big one inch piece of steel that Doug makes for me that I grind with this long swept back grind and I call it the bull roughing gouge because that's what I use. It gets rid of all these lumps and bumps without fighting it. Uh, I'm going to bring in the tailstock because I'm only on a screw center. <coughs> And the belt should be tight enough. We'll find out. And uh, so the first thing I want to do is get round. And I want to create a place for my chuck here and grab it, flip it over, and then we'll make this side run through. Get rid of that chuck all in one motion. If you use a 5 8 or 3 quarter inch deep flute gouge for this work to get rid of all these bumps all of, all of that shock has to be absorbed by the poor little left arm all by itself because this hand ain't doing much this tool you don't present it this way you present it this way and all, both your hands are behind it and all the force is driven down into the tool rest so you want to make sure that's good and tight so it doesn't sink down and this just chunks it away with very little effort. You're not fighting anything. It's, it's all happy news. it leaves a pretty rough thing, but that's why it's called the bull roughing gouge. Once it's short around like this, it's time to switch to a 7 or 5 eighths uh, piece of steel. I use a 2 and 5 eighths inch projection. 600 grit wheel, that's a pretty fine wheel. I'm just finding my, my happy spot here. Every grinder is set up a little different. I just use the bevel I have as a setup feel. I hit my edge perfectly. And I took so little steel away because these wheels can do that, unlike stone wheels, because they're perfectly round. There's no bouncing around. You don't have to push against the wheel to fight the bouncing and take away way more steel than you need to take away. All you have to do I prefer to call it power honing because that's what these wheels can do. And then I have this thing called a bench wrench. And that this should be mounted somewhere, but we're okay with hand free handing it to loosen the collet. And I usually have that right by my grinder somewhere what speed did you start out at? but I'm going to tell you I got a pretty good sense it was about 300, 350 and this it's about maybe 500 I love demonstrating how powermatic with the readout because I can go 705 oh I was wrong 704 <laughs> <laughs> it's funny what you can get good at if you do it enough slow D-cell, long D-cell. I don't have as much of that white wood as I was hoping for. There might be more in there somewhere. But rub the bevel. 
So many of my students, I, I ask every student, do you rub the pebble? Oh, yeah, sure I do. Of course I do. No, most, 97% of them don't rub the pebble. They think they're rubbing the pebble, but they're pointing the tool, and they're dragging it across the wood, and they get a lot of little ripple, 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 ripple. And then I, I, I said, don't get nervous now. I'm going to come up behind you. I'm going to reach around. I'm going to grab the tool. And I'm going to say, not there, but there, there, like that. And then we go. And he goes, oh, wow. Okay, I'm going to let go. Don't change anything. And I walk away. Now you're rubbing the bevel. And that's all it takes. One shot like that, and they got it. Just got to push them a little bit. But you see the difference in the cut. I'm shearing the wood. I'm, I'm cutting the wood free before I'm asking it to go away. The other tool doesn't do that. It just chunks it away. But it takes the work out of the roughing down to round for you. Well, that's about 700. 708. See, this, this making round is okay to do with this tool. It's different. It's, it's fine. There's no kick in your arm. We're rubbing the battle. We still have a little little bit of chainsaw right there. There's a little tear out here because I'm just rubbing the bevel of the tip of the tool. That's not the best cut. You want the, you want the cut to happen way along the side here. That's what makes my grind outstanding because when I grind, I swing past 90 degrees. The side of the tool is not flat. There's curve there. I can cut way back here and get a real shearing cut. I'm going to do that now to get rid of that. So the handle goes way down here on my knee. I put on a short desail now and stop quicker. You see all that weather with that tear out? No more. Because the angle of the cut, the shearing action. And here, when you're cutting like this, directional control isn't by swinging the handle, it's, it's rotation. The bevel is rubbing, you want to dive in, you rotate it a little, you want to come out, you rotate it a little. Just all in tiny rotations. I'll show you. So here I'm, I'm going, and I twist a little bit, and then dive again. Then I twist a little bit back, and I'm coming out. I used to do it with a face plate on top. For years, I screwed a face plate to the top, and that's how I started. Well, the screws required as much wood. You can't make a hat out of seven inches of wood. You've got to have seven and a half inches of wood to accommodate those screws. The chuck only requires this much wood. Bigger, better deal, and it perfectly, I was convinced that I had to apply a face plate and leave it there until I'm ready to do the top. It, you can, you can make it run true enough. Because I'm, you know, when I'm reversing a hat, it has to run absolutely true. Because I'm going this thick. I can't have it moving even a 64th or, or 128. Nothing. Zero. It has to be perfect. You can do that with a chuck mounted here. But I, do, I apply the chuck now while it's still... Everything I've made so far, I want to be true to. The other thing about doing it with a chuck... I have this little nipple here with a perfect center mark on it. It relates to all of this. I'm going to leave that there. So when I take it out of the truck and put it on the wood jaws, bring it right back again. You don't get that if you use a faceplate. I got these jaws. And I open that up to about four and three quarter inches. So if I have to, I can, if I really want to move up away from that check, I can make a hat out of about six inches of wood, not seven. So if that check pursues us, we can do a lot to get away from it. 
Maybe not, though, because the, the wood wasn't nicely round on top. It was more like, like lopsided. So I got bark on one side. So before we get down where there's enough diameter for the crown of the hat, we're going to be down here somewhere. And this bark is, yeah. I'm gonna have, I'm, I'm just gonna waste some wood away now. There's no sense leaving a lot of wood on top that we have to take away later when the hat's all thin. I'm gonna get rid of some of that wood now. Just because I have to with that bark. I have to have that, the highest part of the edge of the crown there. If this is four and three quarter, that's five and a quarter, five and a half. I gotta have roundness without bark at five and a half diameter. And I'm gonna get rid of this nipple too. And I'm gonna re remark the center. So I get that back when I, when I'm done. And wanna put it on the wood jaws. Four and three quarter. We'll do it there. I'll make my tenon, but the tenon will not be all wastewood because the, the brim of the hat, the crown of the hat, is going to have to come up here, and we're going to have to get down to there to get that. Make the tendon straight, no taper. Get a little more grip on it this way, and I can still preserve a little more height of crown. I like these Nova Live Centers because it's got a cupped center point, and it's got the tapers all there all the time, and it's taking on, no taking anything on, off, on, off, on, off. It's just there. And then push this in, center it all up. Run it, make sure the chuck body is true. It is. I always tighten the other side of the chuck because there's always another eighth turn. Oh, I don't know why, but there is. Steel stretches a little. So good and tight. No chance of it falling out of there. We're good to turn around and flush that off over there. Because I want to see where the, the brim has to live before I come back over here to do the outside of the hat. Now at home I have a handle on every piece of steel. I don't. I'm not cheap with handles. I got handles and handles, right? And most people buy one or two handles and switch steel all the time. And if my bench fronts were all mounted up and I could just go, then I might do that. Because even here on that surface, it's easier to get rid of the lumps and bumps with this than it is with a with a regular gouge. because everything is driven down. If you present like this, it's driven this way. So a pricey piece of steel, but save your arm. And we have the benefit too, if we're doing a Range Rider hat, that up-curving shape of the brim helps us get away from that pith check. There is a little tiny, it only goes about 5 sixteenths deep this way, it's barely open, goes three quarters up this way, five-eighths worth of wood here to, here to there. I can go up 
you know that three eighths and still be happy and get good crown height. So you see, now I've changed the position. I'm not like this with the tool anymore. I'm, I'm like this, and I'm actually rubbing the bevel and making a nice cut. It's perfectly possible to make a finished cut with this thing. I'm going to go up like that first with the shape of the brim, and we might we might gain a little bit from that. We have a little tiny knot right at this other end, which is kind of fun because they can cause a little bending that happens that could be like a little twitch in the brim. I've had these before more than once. Okay, so that's going to be the edge of our brim or very close. I might change it a little. Once we make the crown of the hat, it'll tell me more about how much do I need. I could wind up moving that up a little more. But I've sealed it with super glue, so it's stabilized for now. But I'm going to make a, a three and a half inch recess here that we can flip this back on to. And that wants to be cut pretty damn perfect because it will affect how everything centers up later. So you gotta, I go in like this and I come back out, roll the tool far enough over so the part of the tool I'm working with amounts to a negative rake shear scraper. And just pull back drag out of there and get that to run absolutely concentric. And then I don't take this away from the lathe and put the chuck in it and I put the chuck in it, put this in it, line everything up and then flip it over. Here I don't really have to forcibly tighten. I don't need to tighten the other side because I just it's holding it well enough and I'm gonna have this in that chuck the whole time. So I don't need the super grip for this one. same thing that was there before so we're okay I have a if we, once we've turned the outside of this and flip it around if it's doing this at all I can fix it I'll show you that when we get there even if it's not doing it I'll show you how I would have fixed it so I always save a ring of wood here with my coring tool so I waste this and then save this ring because I make mirror frames out of that and the mirrors are a great item when you're at a craft show trying to sell hats. People got to be able to see themselves. And so you got to have a mirror in the booth. And if you got to have a mirror, it might as well be for sale. I make that fairly smooth because I, I want to put layout on there. When I make a mirror ring, I gotta have make them in nine and a half, ten and a half, eleven and a half, twelve and a half, depending on how much I got to work with. Because specific sizes, because then I can buy a specific size mirror 
and I can make a frame to fit 10 inch, 11 inch, and 12 inch, 13 inch glass. So there's no way to stick a ruler through there to put that layout. So I used my big, my big quick adjust calipers. <laughs> so now I got these points ten and a half inches apart, and I can come here like this, scratch a line, and that jaw's not quite lining up. So I got to move in a little bit, and then I, when they line up, I push and I get a line. So now it's ten and a half. I plunge in there. Part mega parting tool that can make cores. Put it that way. Not really a coring system, but you can make cores with it. It's, for my little, for in this hat, I'm just going to get a mini hat core out of the center. We call it the Magnus core. It's because my middle name is Magnus, believe it or not. It's Latin for great. So it's better when Maggie, not so great. Magnus, okay. We'll take Magnus. My grandfather's name was Magnus. I was born in Denmark. In, in all of Europe, Johannes is John. John the Baptist is Johannes the Baptist. <laughs> There's cathedrals all over Europe named for me. Very common name over there. Over here nobody's ever heard it. So this tool, everybody, oh, wood turning weapon, they go, oh, makes it sound dangerous, right? No, it's not at all dangerous. It's incredibly easy to use. It goes in the armpit, and it's a one-arm deal. This arm can control the whole tool, which is a good thing, because it leaves this hand free to do this, so it doesn't all shavings don't fly up over your head and down the back of your shirt. You have to widen the curve a little, pushing up against one side. And you can see it, it folds the shaving. It creases the, the point is quite pointy. It's an included angle of 55 degrees. It's way pointier. The original ones I used were 80 degrees. They're almost square. This more pointy folds the shaving, which is a good thing. It helps them come out. If there's a shaving over the nose, they won't cut. You've got to get past that. So if you're looking for something to make some a few cores with, it's just to get a little extra wood out of your effort. That's not a coring system. And I defy anybody to do this with a coring system, and it wouldn't work. This is a great tool. I gotta know how deep I am. I hold my thumb there. And I'm down to about there. And that's good enough. I can go a little below that. Start below that and go in a little bit and then angle upward to connect the cuts. Here's where catching the shavings is really good because if I let them go right down my neck. And like I said, this hand controls everything. Once it's in there, I use the left hand a little bit to line it up, but then it's all That knot that we have here died 20 years before the tree got here. Well, we'll see if it's still there when we get where the hat is. Looking more and more like a hat all the time. Only a little bit left and we're still going smaller, so we're going to be fine. It's good. It's going to be a nice little figured feature there. Like a little crotch wood from that branch. It's gonna be right, right where there ought to be a feather. <laughs> Not a bad deal. There's the end grains right here. Yeah, it's gonna be like here on the hat. Seven and three quarter inches. That's a pretty average hat size. So that has a good chance of possibly fitting the person who's gonna get it. So this is our size. 
this right here is the diameter that we want down there. Okay, so I'm going to make some cuts and get closer to the... Uh, I'm going to use the 5 8 for a couple more cuts, but then I'm going to shift to a half inch. A half inch, and this 5 8 is pretty dull. I can't even cut myself on it. I'm just roughing in, so it doesn't matter. And a lot of... this is a good one. It brings up a point. Someone always asked me during a demo or teaching, how do you know when to sharpen your tool? Well, and the answer is not the obvious one, when it's dull. Because this is dull, but I'm still making cuts. But I'm getting fuzz, bad cuts, they're miserable. It doesn't matter, it's not a finished cut. The answer is, sharpen your tool when you're about to do a finished cut. When, when you're going to make a finished cut, that's when you want the sharp tool to get the best possible finished cut. Any other time, I mean, I could use the tool for a year and still make shavings. What I can't do is make a good finished cut. Simple as that. So six times on the course of a hat, I will sharpen a tool to get that good finished cut. I really haven't really sharpened a tool. I just sharpened this one a little bit to make my life easier, but it's dull now. It's totally dull. I can't cut myself. So I'm using a different part of the tool. It's probably a little sharper than the tip of the tool I made most of these cuts with. And you basically have to marry your body to the steel, the handle, the tool, everything. You really, you want good, solid connection. Because you don't stand up flat-footed and guide the tool with your arms. You lock the tool to your body and guide the tool with your knees. All of this. The tool has to be like this to get a good cut. See, very little tear out here compared to that. We've got a nice blush of uncolored wood here around that knot. So my size is still way up here. And I can put the center of the calipers over the tailstock. Both jaws are hitting the same place. So that's, I want to pick that up and carry it down like a cylinder. That's going to be my band. But I want to do that with a sharp tool, half inch. The half inch in an 18 inch handle is the tool I use absolutely the most. And this is right off the grinder at home. Sharp as hell. I don't even have to grind it. This happens to be a U-shaped flute. And it's funny, I, I always use V flutes because Jerry Geyser told me to use a V flute. There's almost no difference between using this or a V. It doesn't, they work just the same. I can still cut way back here. Low, 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 tool on the leg. And you see the darker result? That's because there's no little fuzzy fibers. They're all cut. One thing a U-shaped tool can do better than a V is across the bottom of a bolt, just because the rounded nose has a longer cutting edge when you're across the bottom of a bolt. So I don't have enough crown height yet. My, my band should really be down in there. Right now I have about four and five-eighths of crown height. Five is kind of where I go. Four and, a, four and five eighths. I could make a hat. I have made hats with that amount of crown. Uh, remember a guy named Deputy Dog? His hats were flat, very low. There are low crowned hats, but I, I don't like low crowned hats. I like pretty generous crowns. Five, five and a quarter, five and a half. You go beyond five and a half and start speaking like, okay, must have been made for a short guy looking to gain some height. <laughs> and, uh, the, uh, the beauty of this is I think we're going to gain more of this good stuff as we go down there. But so right now I'm, I'm doing the size of the band. If I was making this to custom fit someone, I really got to nail that size. I should talk about that too, even though we're not uh, going to do it. Um, I use a Curvex ruler to pick up 
the size and the ovalness all at the same time. And then I draw that out on paper and um, just make a quick drawing. Just a quick oval. Let's say this is the head. And we measure this and let's say we get six and a half. And then we measure this and let's say we get eight. We add that together and we get fourteen and a half. We divide that by two. We get seven and a quarter. That typically is half size. But to get that, we gotta add a half inch. Because we're gonna put the the calipers on the outside, and we're going to have a, an eighth inch on the band. We'll have an eighth inch of thickness here, and an eighth inch of thickness here. That accounts for a quarter. We have to add that quarter, and then we have shrinkage. The wood is not fresh cut. If this was cut yesterday, I would add three-eighths for shrinkage. But it was cut in April, so I'm going to add only a quarter for shrinkage. So my OD is going to be seven and three quarters, just what we talked about. And the caliper is, I believe, still set for that. I always like to check seven and three quarters. Yeah. And we're not quite there anywhere here. So I'm still tapering out. I'm getting bigger, intentionally getting bigger as I go. But somewhere along here is going to be my seven and three quarters. And like I said before, I'm doing this high on the hat. The reason for that is, this isn't where the band is going to be. The band is going to be further down to get the crown height I want. I do it here, get it right, do the brim, get wood out of the way, carry that down. It gives me, if I, if I, if I blow it up here and get a little less than seven and three quarters, I can salvage it by, and here I'm, I'm right where it falls by. So I'm way back here with my seven and three quarters. So this is like practice for the real band, what it boils down to. So if I've got four and five eighths and I gain an inch here, if I gain three quarters, I'll have five and three-eighths. That's plenty of crown height. So conceivably, I could still move this brim away from that checking a little bit. And I have, I'm there, I got five and an eighth of crown height. I'm good with that. We're going to leave it at that, because then I can move. This will be the edge of my band here, right there. Not this. I'm going to move up to that and make the brim there as opposed to down here. Because the shape of the brim has to be such that it curves down, bottoms out, and then curves up. And where it mates the crown, it should be five-eighths of an inch above this edge of the finished brim. Because that's what yields the good bent shape. You can do a 50-50. I do a one-third down, one-third back up, and then the last third almost straightens out before it hits the crown of the hat. Because I like that leaping animal kind of shape that that gives. The 50-50, one big curve, doesn't give that shape. There's little nuances in turn shape that affect the way it will bend. So I'm going to square up this edge of the brim here to the travel direction of the brim. Shape here so I can stop and see where that pith crack is. If we got away from it entirely, we may have. Putting super glue in it before I do this cut is a good thing. That pith knot that we had that created this that had little pith cracks in the knot itself. Those are all super glued. That should be fine. So now I can move this up. And I'm going to do that from right here. Because I still have good mass here. 
So it'll be good, stable cutting if I do it here now, as opposed to waiting after taking all of this away and then flip it over. Then this could be kind of thin and, and tending to move while I'm trying to cut it. Back dragging, shear scraping kind of cut on it to get the shape and good uh, surface at the same time. If you glance a light, it shows little ripples and things that you can then deal with. But again, the tool is like connected to me. All the shaping is in, in the hips and the knees. And I can go in either direction. I can push the cut, I can pull the cut. It's, it's a shear scrape. So the, the tool is pointed this way. All the cutting is happening in that direction off the grain. That one third of the brim that has to curve upward should curve upward about three eighths of an inch. I'm looking at that here. I'm going to sharpen myself up a piece of half inch that has a V flute and a longer cutting edge. So now I can, with a sharp, sharp tool, I can, with the light here, with the ripples I see, I can get rid of all those ripples and, and really get a nice surface. Producing that darker color that we like because it's really cutting. It's not leaving any uncut fuzzy fibers on the surface. Now I'm going to finish the, the rest of the shape of the brim. I brought a spray bottle, which is a good thing when you have to take a break in the middle of a hat. Generally I don't, but we will. And you just wet the whole surface. You don't have to bag it or anything. Just give it a good drink of water and it'll stay wet while you go eat. And now here the cut is your choice. It's the easy uh, way is to back drag shear scrape. It's safer. The other way is to roll the tool over completely, position the handle so that the bevel is rubbing. It's going to go in the same direction as, so it's easy enough to, to put the handle so that the bevel is in line with the bottom surface that we just made. And we need to go in with the tool completely closed, meaning rolled away, flute dead away. That makes the tip absolutely vertical. If I go into this thin edge with the tool back like this, it's slanted that way. It's going to pull that way and rip this whole thing to shreds. So you have to totally close the tool and I'm going to look for a bite that's going to give me the edge of brim thickness that I want, which is about a shy 30 seconds, just like that. Once I'm in there a shy 30 seconds, I can roll the tool over because the back of the tool has a bevel to rub on. And then I drop the handle a little as I go, and I follow through. It leaves a better surface than a... Than a uh, Shear scrape. Starrett calipers. $72. Worth every penny. Made in Athole, Massachusetts. Spring knot. Polished, rounded jaws. Will not scratch your work. Beautiful calipers. But nobody wants to pay the price. So right at the, the edge is where I'm the thinnest. Back here I'm still a quarter inch. I'm nowhere near i got to put a light behind. So I'm going to give it a drink of water right now for all those reasons. I don't so much need the light for brim thickness. And the fact is the discoloration of the wood makes it not transluce very well. But where I really need the light is up inside the crown. And we have some white wood there and we're, we're happy. From this finished edge up to this point, five eighths of an inch. And that's basically what we have there. So I'm just going to connect this point to this point, thin this out some more, make the thickness, and from here I'm pushing a cut because that's off the grain till I hit the bottom. When it starts to curve back up again, I'm up against the grain. So all of that from here to here I have to pull cut. I'm going to remove some of that wood that's in the way with the 5 8 the dull 5 8 just to save the edge on my nice Brand new, fresh off the grinder piece of half inch. And get rid of wood and 
and then use the sharp tool for the, the, the finishing cut. And the idea is to come up into the crown of the hat at about 15 degrees of angle. Because if you, if you come into the crown of the hat too flat, that flat brim acts like the web of an I-beam. It won't, it won't let the sides of the hat do this. Whereas you come in like this and you want the side of the hat to go, it can do that. It has a hinging effect. If you're in flat, no hinge. It tears right there when you squeeze it enough to try to make oval in this. So, for that reason, we can't make Smokey the Bear hats. Smokey's out of luck. Can't have a wood hat. So here I'm putting the bevel on the part of the brim that's already the right thickness. And I'm pushing a cut, and that cut became a big 16th, where it was a quarter inch before. So I, I, not a quarter inch anymore, but I'm still thick there. And because these have those nice polished tips, I can stop. I can measure without having to stop. I'm going to stop there, because I want the thickness that's behind me to keep stabilizing this while I finish the thickness for this first three quarters of an inch. So to get that same, now I've used the tip of the tool a few times here now, so it's not as sharp as it was when it came off the grinder. So to, to avoid having to go back to the grinder, I just simply pull the handle up like this and do the same cut. I'm using a different part of the tool that hasn't seen the wood yet, but I'm doing exactly the same cut. Pointing downhill a little bit gives it a skew-like effect. So now, behind there, I'm about a 30 second thinner than I am right at the edge, which was the desired result. Right at the edge, I'll leave a little thickness. I used to do hats at what I've got at the side of the edge, 3 30 seconds, the whole thing. For years, that was the size, the thickness I did. And then someone said, can they be thinner and lighter? Well, I do mini hats less than a sixteenth. Yeah, I could do a big hat less than a sixteenth. Well, I think you should do that. And I did. And the, the hats went from nine to ten ounces to like five or six ounces. Ultra light. I made one once that was four and three quarter ounces. Super thin. That's so thin, it just feels like, you, you grab it and there's, oh, it feels like it'll break when you hold the hat. And, uh, so, somewhere between there, five, six, seven ounce hat is ideal. So I'm set for that thickness that I like right here. I go to go in further and it's rubbing. So I open up, open up, open up. About there, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna carry my thickness to that point right there. I'm gonna rub with my caliper so I know where I want it to go. And I'm looking at that. It's three sixteenths. I want a fat sixteenth. So I, obviously, I need to take away two sixteenths from here. Push a cut and make it become a sixteenth. Didn't quite. Let's do another one to make that become a 16. Now I'm, I'm worried that I just need to measure again. So I pick up the thickness where I liked it. I go in and, and it starts to rub right there. So I need to do just a little more of the same. And here I'm using the side of the tool, pointing the tool downhill, getting a sharp part of the tool. Okay, I think that part is done. It's nice and smooth. And I can pull cut the rest of this to the shape that I want. I've got a little more than five eighths. I've got like three quarters here. I'm gonna shrink that down some more. Just a little bit. Right around there. In this cut, the tool is in this position. The the part of the tool that's cutting is just about level. It's not shear scraping. It's somewhere between a shear scrape and a cut. Works fine. Then I have a trick that I do with the light to show me this shape. It's hard to see that whole curve. You really can't. This gets in your way. You can't see the whole curve 
while you're working it. So you put the light down here like this. Well, I can show it on the video. And then you can see the video later. You can see the shadow line of the tool rest. And it's showing the curve. So I have the light there while I'm working. And I can make that curve perfect. To be able to see that curve as I work, the light here. And the reason I point it at the floor is just to get a slice of light. Because then the shadow line is more focused. If I point it at the work, it's very fuzzy. It's very important that this, this shape be just right because that's what makes the good bend happen. If this line is too straight, it won't bend well. If it's too curved, it'll bend really well, but it won't look good. It has to be a very perfect balance between last half inch of this can be straight. After that, it has to curve a little bit. Getting out of this valley smoothly and connecting the two cuts is hard to do. But going a little beyond where you're starting to go up against the end grain helps get that curve better and then you back drag the rest. And this tool doesn't fit the shape as perfectly as it ought to. It's a little hard to get it to be just the way you want it. But I've discovered that that big old bull roughing gouge fresh off the grinder fits this curve really nice. And I can get rid of a lot of little ripples and things that this tool is leaving behind. So I get the shape right first, and then I just grind that big steel and do a very light shear scrape and, and perfect it. That, oh yeah, world of difference. Perfect for that shear scrape.